نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والي الكريم وصلى الله على أنبياء أجمعين والمسيح والمحسي والمجدد لما أن مرسلين Are we not the bearers of witness that nothing would exist if Allah didn't create it? And that He is alone and has no part. And that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sustainer of all the boundless universes. All gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous eternal friend. And send salutations of Allah on all of His prophets and His apostles and on the Messiah, the anointed one. And on the Mahdi, the God, and on the Mujaddid, the Reformer, which was all sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And now, the true light featuring Is Sayyid al Imam Isa al Hadi al Mahdi. Uh, hello. Uh, I, I don't have the uh, <coughs> uh, specific uh, text or whatever, but I, it's a question referring to um, uh, Isaiah mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that Christians used to say that was prophesying Jesus Christ, where it mentions that uh, he would be uh, pierced in his side, uh, what mm -hmm. have you. I was going to ask you if it's not referring to Jesus, then who is it referring to? Remember, the book of Isaiah is revealed in the year 732 B.C in Jerusalem. And if you just read the number one chapter, the number one verse, it will tell you who they're talking to. I'm saying because Christians tend to move away from the beginning of each verse and go into the contents of the verse and then give it to Jesus. Read what the Creator who sent this revelation to Isaiah said and who he said he was giving it to. Read it right there. Right in Isaiah 1. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah. Now, who is this vision about? The vision of Judah, the son of Emma. It was concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Jesus was not even born during this period of time. Go ahead. Right. The days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heaven, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth its owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people does not consider. When the brother is teaching, or when he's being confronted by people concerning that subject, mm -hmm. and it's a good subject about the piercing, because they seem to identify that with Jesus a lot. Mm -hmm. Also, when he's talking to a Christian who needs to know the truth, what they're sincere, the book of Psalms, which was also revealed in the year 460 BCE to mm -hmm. David, Asaph, and Solomon. Go to the 22nd Psalms, the 16th verse. This is before Jesus was born, and in the beginning of the 22nd Psalm, it tells you that this 22nd Psalm was revealed to the chief physicians upon what? Ageleth, Shahar, that's who it's for. All right? And it's a Psalm of David. Now read the 16th verse. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now, in the Bible of the book of St. John, chapter 19, verse 18 and verse 37, they would give you the impression that they're talking about Jesus here. Here they talk about a person who has been crucified, and had his hands and his feet pierced, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't know enough to go to the 71st Psalms to find out who they're talking about, you'll get confused. Go to the 71st Psalm. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. So this is David talking, because this is his Psalms, and he didn't start off telling you who he's talking to. He started off talking in the first person. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is David. Go ahead. Deliver me in thy righteousness, and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me. Now, here's someone who's trying to escape something. Something that's about to happen to him. This is David saying this. Go ahead. And save me. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my Creator, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For Thou art my hope, O Lord Creator. Thou art my trust from my youth. 
but thee have I been holding up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. If you read this here, if a person doesn't know this is David, Christians can easily make you think they're talking about Jesus, about the birth and the guidance and to deliver me from the hands of my enemies and deliver me up and putting thy words in me. You would really think that it's talking about Jesus if you didn't know. Now go ahead. I am at a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. Many people are confused about me, but my strength resides in the Father. This is David saying. Go ahead. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Supposedly Jesus had made that statement. Well, I'll let you go back and I'll show you where David made that statement way before Jesus was even born. The same statement. Go ahead. For mine enemies speak against me, and they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together. That's the same thing he said in Psalms 2. Now go back. Let's just jump around for a minute so we can be up on what's happening here. Psalms 2. Why do the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel, what, together, together against the Lord and against his anointed. Had they not taken that word and translated it to anointed like they do when they feel like, you would get the word Messiah here. David is referred to in this verse, the second psalm, as the Messiah. They say, counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Messiah. Now, if you look in any Bible dictionary, be it Seventh-day Adventist, Jehovah Witness, Pentecostal, Baptist, Lutheran, Protestant, Catholic, they'll always tell you that the word Messiah means anointed one. Here, they change it into anointed, but throughout the New Testament, they keep saying Messiah or Christ. So they have a way of playing with words and selecting the times they want to translate them into nouns, and other places they'll leave nouns. So go ahead. Let us break their bonds asunder and cast away their cords from us. Mm -hmm. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in the Derision. They will divide against themselves. Mm -hmm. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Mm -hmm. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Here David is called the king of all Zion. Jesus is also called the king of all Zion in the book of Revelation. In this same chapter 2 and of 2, David is called the Messiah. Jesus is also called the Messiah. Go ahead. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, they make that announcement about Jesus. Here, they're making the same announcement about David, that David is the son of God. Right here. Not Jesus. But in Luke 1, 35, if you all go to it later, you'll see they make the same statement about Jesus. The point I'm trying to make is, Jesus was a Messiah, not the only Messiah. He was a king over Israel, not the only king of Israel. He was a king over Zion, not the only king of Zion. He was a son of God, not the only son of God. That's the point that the Bible is making. He was a person who they thought was crucified. David and Emmanuel were men who the Bible confirms were crucified. Go ahead on. Well, that's basically it. Now you can go back to Psalms. 71? 71, yeah, because it's going to get even deeper. Okay, we're at verse 8, 71. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. Now stop right there. Now turn to Psalms 22, 1. Now this is to the chief musician. Again, what's the first verse that David said? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now the Christians will take you to Matthew 27, 46 and tell you that was Jesus. This is David talking. He makes the statement before Jesus was on the cross. Are you telling me that Jesus was quoting something David said while he was on the cross? Or was David rehearsing something for Jesus to say when he'd be born? And the Bible says that this here quote, Psalms 22, was to the chief musicians. So Jesus wasn't even born when the chief musicians existed. So this here quote was not for Jesus, it was like, unless the Christians who have a tendency to do, is when they get to the facts, they jump over into, into mythology. This is a fact, and every Bible you read in the books of Psalms, we're fortunate because it tells you who these books came to. It gives you a safe margin that says, this was given to the chief musicians of, 
Ejela and Shana. It was a song of David. So now, then David said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Go on. Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Is this Jesus' call? Jesus said that the Father would never leave him comfortless. He'd never be left without help. He was always there. How can it be Jesus? Matthew 27, 46, the man on the cross is about to die. And he's saying that God is forsaking him while he's about to die. Shouldn't it be the other way? Man has forsaken him and he's getting nearer to God. That's how it should be. And they've turned it backwards. Go ahead. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou what? Here is not. Now Jesus said, Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. This man is saying, I called out to you, God, but you did not hear me. In Christianity, they tell us that Jesus is an incarnation of God, done by the Holy Spirit. So now Jesus is an incarnation of God, and that was God being crucified on the cross for man's sins, then how could he not hear himself? Because this guy just said what? And I call know, out. And thou hearest not. And you don't hear me. Well, if this was Jesus, and Jesus was on the cross, and he was God, how could he not hear himself call out? And if he was God, who was he calling out to? God is calling out to somebody for help? And Allah is whom all seek help? Allah is wahtahu la sharika lahu? He's the one who has no partners? So how can this person be the creator of the heavens and the earth, be on the cross saying, why have you deserted me? Who's the you then? If I'm the I, who's the you? And if the I is the God, then the you must be somebody else other than Allah. So that's a serious mistake. And if you go right on, it'll go on. It'll say, but thou art holy. Al Qudus. O thou that inhabitest the praise of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. See, now this person is putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separate from himself. He said, our fathers, meaning the children of Israel, put their trust in you, Allah. So this man could not have been God himself. Because he just said, he didn't say, our fathers put their trust in me. He said, our fathers put their trust in thee. You, other than myself. This is Jesus talking according to y'all. We know this is David talking. <laughs> Go ahead. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man a reproach of men and despised of the people. This is Jesus who called himself a worm. This is Jesus saying he's a reproach of men. And Jesus was despised, but not by everybody. Read the book of John. You'll find out that Jesus was not despised by everybody. He was not hated by everybody. He had many, many followers. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, was one of his followers. When he raised Lazarus, all of the tribe of Judah that was in the house of Martha and Lazarus, they believed in Jesus when they saw that. He fed multitudes of people on the mountain with fish and loaves of bread. They believed in him. He turned water into wine in a wedding at Cana. They believed in him. Everybody didn't despise Jesus. They said there was a diversity of opinions about whether he was a false prophet or not. But this man said, people hated me. All they that see me laugh. And they shake their heads saying, what? He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. For thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my, my God from my mother's belly. This is Jesus saying, thou art my God? I thought your Christians told me he was God. Right? You said he was God. This person said, thou art my God. Thou took me out the womb of my mother. Not that... God himself was in the womb of somebody, he didn't say that. He said, you took me out the womb of my mother, not that I was in the womb, or like they Christians put it, that God came down and was planted into the womb of a woman to deliver himself to save the world of sin. That's not what this is saying. This is saying that you took me out the womb of my mother. Didn't say that you were me and I were you while I was in the womb of Mary. This is a different birth. Go ahead. Be not far from me. For trouble is near, for there is none to help. That's right. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Which is in the Jordan. They gaped upon me with their mouths, as a raven and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, 
it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a poor shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me, they part my garments among them. Notice this. Now this is Matthew 24, 35, Luke 23, 34, and John 19, 24, where they start talking about Jesus' garments being parted amongst the soldiers. However, this is David, not Jesus. Go ahead. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, my strength. Haste thee to help me. Did would Jesus, if he was God, need God to come help him if he was not? Could God be far away from him if, according to Christians, God was already inside him? How can you be far away from a person inside him at the same time? How can you come help a person if you are that person? This is obviously not the same person. Deliver my soul from the sword. Go my, ahead. My darling, from the power of the dog, save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. Now we get to another major point here. Whoever this man is who's talking is not talking to Gentiles. And all these people over here who call themselves Gentiles, who don't claim to be of the house of Israel, this man here, who's asking for deliverance for himself and his people, says right there who he's talking to. The seed of Jacob, the seed of Israel, is who this man is talking to. He's not talking to the Catholic Pope. He's not talking to Gentiles. He's talking to Ben Israel alone. The chosen of Israel, like Jesus said many times, I did not come under the Lordship of the House of Israel. David's making the same statement. Of course, when I say it, I'm a racist. But when a prophet says that he's not, that's not a prophet. So when I make statements that I only came to my people, I'm a racist. But when Jesus said, I only came to the Lordship of the House of Israel, that's not racism. When David says, save my people, Jacob's seed, that's not racism. If Jacob's seed is one race of people, correct? Correct. And David is saying, I came for that race of people, is that not Racism. So why is it when I do it, I'm a racist. When they do it, it's some type of genetic history thing. Racism is racism. Go ahead. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. Y'all continue that by yourself. Now go into back to 71 because in 71... David again picks up more information about the crucifixion and it makes people think that it's Jesus again. Remember this is a very key point that these books of Psalms and Isaiah had already been written some hundreds of years and some thousands of years before Jesus' disciples, correct? Correct. It is very easy for me to pick up the autobiography of Malcolm X and pick a person out of it and then say this applies to them. You understand? Once the book has already been written, I can come after, take verses from it, and make it apply to anybody I feel like. I'm saying that to say the Christians have taken prophecies out of a scriptures that were previously written, and then wrote their own scriptures that it applies to Jesus. Now that's quite easy to do when the books of the Torah and all the prophets that have already been written, all they got to do is pick any section they want and say this applies to Jesus. And that works with Christians because they don't read the whole chapter. They don't go back to the beginning and see who these chapters are talking to. They don't check dates to find out when that book was revealed, who it was revealed to, what was happening when it was revealed, what place it was being revealed at. They don't do that. They just grab a verse out and say, he passed his signs, you know. He said, that must be Jesus because that's what they say about Jesus. Instead of reading this whole piece and seeing what it's talking about. Proceed on, it's going to get even deeper. But For mine enemies speak against me. And they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together. And that's what took us back to Psalms 2, remember? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Saying, God has forsaken him. Person Isn't that what they said about Jesus? That's correct. They said, if you are the Son of God, what? Come down off the cross. Correct? Correct. Isn't that what they say they said? That's correct. Go ahead. Persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. If you are God's Son, cast yourself down off the mountain. He'll send his heavenly angels to grab you. What did Jesus say? 
He said, tempt not the Lord, the Lord thy God. You don't tempt God. Go ahead. Oh God, be not far from me. Oh my God, make haste for my help. Oh my God, or am I God? This said, oh my God. So this definitely can't be Jesus. <laughs> you see? Go ahead. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonored that seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall shew forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. I don't know when I'm going to die. How long it's going to be before I die. According to the Christians, Jesus knew when he was going to die because he was born in the world to die. This man said, I don't know how many days I have. Go ahead. I will go on the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now this man is doing miracles, and this man is saying how he's been taught by the Most High from the day he was born. This is David. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O did, God... Did Jesus ever get old and have gray head according to the Christians? According to the Christians, Jesus died at 33 years old, so he never got old and had gray hair. 33 years old was not old then. So this definitely can't be Jesus. Go ahead. O oh God, forsake me not, until I have shewed thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to everyone that is to come. And let me add, if they say, well, that's because he was saying, when I get old. And if he was saying that, then he didn't expect to die at 33 years old on the cross. There's another side to it, because this quote does really say, now also, when I am old and gray-headed. So this means that this person thought that they were going to live longer. Now, Jesus, according to them, didn't think he was going to live past the year 33. He thought he came in the world to die for man's sins on the cross, according to Paul, according to the Scripture. <laughs> Go ahead. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high, who has done great things. O God, who is like unto thee, thou which has showed me great and sore troubles, has quickened me again, and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Doesn't that sound like resurrection? That's correct. Doesn't that sound just like resurrection? <laughs> That's where the Christians got it from. That Jesus said, I'll be in the bowels of the earth for three days and three nights, or destroy the temple and I shall raise it in three days. There it is right there. In 71 of the Psalms, the 20th verse. Read it again. Thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles, shall quicken me again, and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Okay, go ahead. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. I will also praise thee with the psaltery, even thy truth, O my creator. Unto thee will I sing. Now, did Jesus sing? No. Did Jesus have any song? No. Go back to 22, when you say, I will praise thee with the... Psalms tree. Psalms tree is nothing but the book of Psalms. Mm -hmm. That's not Jesus. He did not receive the book of Psalms. Again, that couldn't be talking to him. Proceed on. Yes. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul, which thou hast redeemed. My tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long, for they were confounded, for they were brought unto shame that seek my hurt. Do you see how simple that is? You see how they fabricated the story and made it up from the books of Psalms? That's where they got it from. If you read Psalms 22 and Psalms 71, you get the whole story of the Christian's crucifixion about David. And they made it look like it applied to Jesus. That's all they did. And remember, this was in the year 460 BCE. That means 460 before the Christian era, before they even was talking about them. When they say BCE, that means before Christian era, before they even discussed the coming of a Messiah, this book had been revealed. The Quran refers to it as Azubur, the Psalms. Okay? <clears throat> Please excuse me, I'm a little nervous. It's the first time that I've come here. Uh, the few times that I've heard uh, uh, you say something, you made a reference that um, that the white man is the devil. And from the way I was brought up and from everything that I've been taught throughout my life, I've always tried to... Um, take a stance where I, I, I deplore prejudice and I, I 
respect and admire uh, Dr. Martin Luther King very much, and I I always try to live my life with the uh, with the feeling that you should never judge a person by the skin of their color. And when I came in here today, and you know, also my friend suggested that I come. She has mentioned also to me that uh, that um, you depict the white man as the devil, and I know that there's some basis for that in the Bible. But what I what I can't seem to reconcile inside myself is that um, you know there is there is evil in in, in every aspect of life, and in, in other words, in every in every person, no matter what color, I've been able to see an evil side and, and a good side. Let me interrupt this one minute because I understand what you're saying. And believe me, you're thinking the right way. Don't let nobody fool you. You're thinking the right way when you say that I've always tried to shun prejudice. And I admire people like Dr. Martin Luther King who's willing to fight, you know, that human beings can live together in peace. You follow? See, all of that is beautiful. The sad thing about it, my sister, is that we're the only ones that preach it. Name one white liberal who stood up in all the history of America for black people to the point of death like Dr. Martin Luther King. They won. I can't. Because they don't exist. What we're teaching is not that the white man is devil and we hate him, blah, blah, blah. We're saying because of what he has given us in return for our love, your father, mm-hmm. like a snake, shun him. Because for our love, what does he give us in return? So you know what our problem is? We can't help the fact that we're just compassionate people. And the people that we're defending, they're not. Those people that were water hosing, the people that Dr. Martin Luther King marched across the country, and white people set out with dogs and water hosed them and beat women in the head with sticks and bit children. And I'm supposed to love a person who thinks like this? I've never done that to him. I've never, we've never, we tried to have a riot. You know what we rioted? Our neighborhoods. We broke up our stores and looted our neighborhoods. We didn't go over to his neighborhoods and riot. Blacks do not harass white people as much as white people harass blacks. It's just that when blacks harass white people, it's a public thing. When white people harass black people, it's a hush-hush out of the court. And I can give you maybe 20 cases this year alone where blacks have been abused or murdered by whites and the whites are getting away with it. And any black that does something, he gets 60 to life. No getting away with it when we do something to white people. But when they do something to us, if a black man rapes a white woman, it's on every page in the magazine. But another thing about Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, right? Though they were good brothers, they both made a major mistake. That major mistake was that they fought for rights that we were already entitled to by the Constitution, which would mean that black people are not considered American citizens. When you have to fight for civil rights or human rights, which the Constitution of the United States already gives you, then you're saying that you are an alien or alien to those rights. So they didn't mean any harm. They just didn't know what they were doing. Dr. Martin Luther King had the biggest heart in the world. What did it get him? It got him shot. And just the other day, two crackers was plotting to do the same thing again to the Reverend Jesse Jackson, right? Mm-hmm. How much news coverage did it really get? Did their faces pop up on the news a lot? On front pages of magazines showing their face, do they tell you more about this organization instead of the wings of the angel or something? Who is the organization founder? Where did it come from? How many people involved in it? Where's the basis of it? What's the basis for them wanting to kill him? Etc. Etc. Do they address that problem? No, because they want to cover it. That is racism, my sister. But it's only considered bad racism when I do it, a black person. When white folks do it, it's not racism. Only when we do it, you become racism. If I say the white man's a devil, up, oh, he's a racist. But Ted Armstrong, or Herbert W. Armstrong, the plain truth, says that Adam and Eve was white and black people was not on the planet back then. That's not racism. But when I do it, I'm a racist. You can look this stuff up, but I'm the racist. Because I come and say, I'm sorry, Charlie, you got it backwards. God, as you call him, must love us more than you because he put the oil, he put the gold, he put the platinum, he put the diamonds, he put all the riches in the world under our feet in Africa. He didn't put nothing in Europe. And if God is the one who controls the elements of the universe, he must have favorites. 
And if the riches of the world are based on diamond, gold, silver, platinum, and petrol, his favorites must be the people who he put on top of it are black people. Now, when I say that, which is historically, scientifically a fact, I'm a racist. I say that it's not fair. But remember this, I respect your emotions because I would never want to take the love you have for all humanity away from you. You understand? Mm -hmm. But I still would tell you, watch the signs. Look at the news. Because the white man that you care about doesn't care about you at all. I have some white friends myself that I've met. When I was traveling to Egypt, I said, these are nice people. But I know the story of a snake. You know the story of the snake, right? You pick him up, and he bites you, and then you say, why did you bite me? And he said, well, you knew I was a snake when you picked me up. And that's what happened to people like Dr. Martin Luther King. He trusted those liberals, and they caused his death. That's the sad thing. He had a good heart. He meant well, and they still killed him. So what is the criteria for when white people kill? They don't kill because you're racist. They don't kill because you're non-racist. They kill because you got too much population control, regardless of what you teach. If you get too much population control and can control votes and therefore control legislation and therefore make decisions over black people without his opinion, they will kill you regardless of what religion it is or what nationality is other than white. And remember, anybody that's not all white to them is not white. If you're mixed, mulatto, mm -hmm. Puerto Rican, then you're considered black to them. They are racist. I'm sorry if I made you think that I hated white people. I don't. If I saw a white woman, an old white woman in distress, I would help them. If I saw 10 black men beating up a white guy, I would try to stop them. Mm -hmm. My love of humanity is not altered by my fear of his devilishment. No more than it would be if I visited the Bronx Zoo and I saw a lion, I admire him, I love him for what he is, but sister, ain't no way in the world you can throw me in his cage. <laughs> and I feel that way about white people. I respect their wit, how they conquer the world with their judgment. They're unbelievably a unique stock of people because they create movies and a guy like Dirty Harry says, pointing a gun at a black man, make my day. And they established in the white American mind that it's all right to kill black people. So now we got all these black people dying at the hands of white people because Dirty Harry is a prophet of that information. And that's not racism. Those people hate me and you. We don't hate them. We've tried to live with them. We've tried to work with them. We've tried all kinds of civil rights movement, NAACP. We've tried all kinds of stuff to communicate. Didn't we try our best? Mm -hmm. How long do we continue to get kicked, spat on, beat, raped, killed, our mothers? When they shot Mrs. Bumpers, that was it. A 60-year-old woman, 60 years old, a guy shoots her with a shotgun because she got a kitchen knife more than once. That was it. That's time for us to be afraid of these people now and stop taking them for granted. I am afraid of them at this point. White people are like raven beasts. They're so intimidated by us that they lash out first. They think that we're so aggressive that they want to stop us before we do something and they kill us. The same way they killed that woman in Harlem. They probably thought she was Puerto Rican, then found out she was Italian and made a mistake and just shot her up. You know the woman in the car? They thought she was a Puerto Rican, then found out she was Italian. They let some brother from Haiti the other day die on the street. A brother, right? They let him die because he tried to stop a drug deal and somebody shot him. They let him die. You want to take a test? You get on a telephone in the public, call 911, and say there's a group of Rastafarians and black Muslims beating an old white woman on the corner of such and such. I guarantee there'll be 50 cars there in no time at all. Correct? and an ambulance, and maybe a fire truck. Mm -hmm. But they let that brother die on the street just because they would not take him to a doctor because of some stuff written on some book by some man that says we can't move a body or so and so, and they let the man die. If that upsets me and makes me lash out at times against white people because of the way they're abusing my people, and if you consider that wrong, I'm very sorry. But I can't help it. I love my people more than I love their people, the way Jesus loved his people, the more than he loved the white, when he said, I did not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel only. He loved his own people first. Okay? Mm -hmm. Say. So, how do you, how, there's so many of them, I mean, they're all around us. How do you, how do you live with trust and, and how do you live in peace and harmony and have trust when, when you know that, um, you know, there's a certain 
element of, of evil that surrounds these people. Cautiously. I'm serious. You have to live very cautiously. I'm saying when you work with them, when you know who they are, you're much more comfortable because you don't get your feelings hurt. You don't anticipate emotional response on your birthday. When they betray you on your job, you know it. See, the thing about them is if you know who they are, when they do finally betray you, you can deal with it. But if you're sitting there like you with a big heart, open to love the world, when they betray you, it really hurts. And I look and I say, if she only would have knew that she was a snake when she picked him up, when he bit her, he would have said, well, okay, all right, that's all right. That doesn't mean I hate every other white person. You bit me, I'm going to get this cured, and I'm going to be more careful the next time. I think you have to be more careful with our emotions. Mm -hmm. We're such loving and outgoing and free-spirited people. They call us colorful and folkful. We just let our emotions go anywhere. I think we have to be as cautious as they are. Let me ask you a short question, right? If you was walking on a train and an old white woman stepped on your foot and said, excuse me, immediately, what would you say? I'd say no problem. Right, you would. Now, reverse the situation on the D train going towards Coney Island. And what do you think would happen? I don't know. What do you think? If you stepped on some old white woman's foot, you know why I picked the D train to Coney Island? Because I'm going towards Sheep's Head Bay, where they got those white people that are as arrogant as we can be. Yeah. And if you stepped on this white woman's foot and said, excuse me, she would just go, no problem. No, I don't No, you get to a little, you careless people. They don't know, niggas are so clumsy. They don't know, you know what I'm saying? You probably would have said worse than that. Or even worse. And that's what I call racism. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying we got to become as ugly as them, because two wrongs don't make a right, my father. Right. Don't right. ever become as ugly as they are. No. But Please be careful, because they're killing us now. It's not before. They used to just call us nigger, spick. They used to get all kinds of goop, slow pegs. They had all kinds of names for us. You know, coconut. That was their derogatory statement. Mm -hmm. They've moved from using language of slander into actually beating us up and killing us now. It changed over the last five years. And we have to be careful, because we're dealing with a man who takes pride in killing. The history of the Western world tells you by its very birth. They came here, Indians was here, they took the land, put the people up on the reservation, and pretend the people never even existed. Right? Mm -hmm. That is the way he does things. He comes in your house, puts you out, and says he discovered it. While you were there, in the kitchen, cooking dinner, he moves in the kitchen, takes your stuff out the pot, throws it in the garbage, puts his stuff in, and says, I discovered this house. Or, I discovered America. Mm -hmm. As if nobody was living here. Right. That's a dangerous man that does a thing like that. There was black people living in South Africa, residing in their homeland, speaking their own language, and worshiping the way they please, when the British invaded that country, mm -hmm. took it over, and now call it Republic of South Africa, and just suppress the people who live there. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the white man has stopped doing what he did. He's still doing the exact same things to black people he did before slavery. This doesn't mean hate him. It means be careful of him. He is dangerous. Mm -hmm. He is a killer. He's a rapist. And again, when you made another good statement, there's a lot of black people that are just as wicked as white people, correct? Mm -hmm. But you have to remember that black people are out of their mind. And I mean that literally. I don't mean that metaphorically. They are literally out of their mind. What do I mean by that? We're not thinking the way we're supposed to be thinking. A, we're not born speaking our language. We're not born in our land, in our environment. You follow? We're not ruled yeah. by ourselves. We're not educated by people of our color. We have no customs, no traditions, no laws, no marriage ceremony, no special diet. We have nothing. So we are really out of our minds. So black people in America and throughout the Caribbean can't be held responsible for the way they think because they're only thinking what they were taught. Mm -hmm. We'll only be able to be judged when we're back in an environment that we control, governed by ourselves, and our, under our own customs. Then if we start acting the fools, then people can say, look at them niggas, they ain't no good. But while we're in a country where the white man makes fun of the way me and you talk, because we might not be as articulate as he is in the language where he created the definitions in his dictionary, but remember, you didn't come here speaking that language. You understand what I'm saying? So we're really out of our minds. We're not in our own frame of mind. So it's very difficult for us to judge our evils because our evils are usually perpetrated against other people basically for survival. 
The white man could be rich, living out in Hempstead, and his son comes over to Harlem to get drugs. You don't hear about too many black kids leaving Harlem to go way out to Hempstead to buy drugs. You follow? We're thrust into the environment of wickedness. They come out of the suburbs looking for wickedness. There's a big difference. So we're really not a bad people. We've been corrupted. And then he stereotyped us. And then in our neighborhood, he puts the stereotype in the store. Niggas wear big hats and high heel shoes and all these color stuff. And then when you look in the store, that's what he got. That's all we could buy. We like Cadillac. Cadillac's a symbol of success. So we buy Cadillac. You know, the subliminal type of thing. And that's all it is. I think, again, I want to go back to the beginning. Your heart is good. Don't alter your heart and the way you feel about all living creatures. Mm -hmm. But just be careful. Because they don't look at you the same way you look at them. And there is no clan meeting in the whole world where a clan member gets up and says, come on, all black people are not bad. Only in our meetings will we do that because we're so compassionate. Only here can you do that. You know what I mean? This is a clan meeting. You think a clan member will get up, take his hood off, and say, come on. All black people are not bad. You know what happened in that clan? Do you have any idea what they do to him? No. Right. Well, I can tell you. It has something to do with rope and tree. They probably hang him. You know what the most frightful thing is? The description of Jesus in the book of Revelation is that he has feet like burnt brass. Brass is naturally a gold color. When you burn it, it will become black, right? Or dark brown. And hair like lamb's wool. Now, and eyes like fire. That means Jesus has red eyes, black skin, and thick hair, all right? Mm -hmm. Imagine if Jesus by accident, which we know he couldn't make, descended down in Alabama and walked in the wrong church to save his people, and it just happened to be one of those clan churches. What do you think they would do to our Lord Jesus Christ when them crackers looked up and saw this brother in this white robe, which makes him look even blacker, with his black skin, his red eyes, this raspy voice, the voice sounds of many waters, <laughs> and this kinky hair, what do you think the clan members would do to him? Well, I'm sure they wouldn't have greeted him with a You're right. smile. You're right. They would have chased him down the block and hung him up on a tree. Correct? That's a sad situation, but it's true. Mm -hmm. If we could rid the world of all racism, it would be a beautiful place to live. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we can't. We've tried. Black people have done everything. We opened the doors of Africa and let the white man in, right? Mm -hmm. And he took you from Africa and put you here. Have you ever heard of any black going to Europe and kidnapping masses amount of Europeans and taking them into Africa? <laughs> huh? No. The Chinese opened their doors up to them, Marco Polo and them. They went into China and saw the fireworks that they used for recreation and turned them into guns. Saw the spaghetti that they ate and called it Italian food. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Is this not a historical fact? Have you ever heard of blacks going to Europe and stealing something and bringing it back? Mm -hmm. No. So, we come to find out what army of blacks, let me ask one more question, what army of blacks left Europe repeatedly in the 10th century, left Europe, remember the crusade, right? To go to Jerusalem, to conquer Jerusalem, because they say that is their city because Jesus was born there. Correct? Mm -hmm. This is what they did. It's in their history books. They call it the crusade. Tell me about some blacks that left their homeland and went to Europe to fight. What blacks have ever fought on the soil of any European country? Is there any? No, it's not. All the wars are them invading other people. Were the Vietnamese over here fighting, or were we over there fighting on their soil? We were over there. Right. You know the funniest thing about America? America said, they bombed us. They were crying. They bombed us. They bombed Pearl Harbor. They were crying. They bombed the Philippines. They didn't bomb America. They bombed other black people, which was the Philippines. Pearl Harbor was in the Philippines, not in the shores of the United States. What did the United States say? They're talking about they bombed us. That's like the house down the block catches on fire because you got your record player down there. They say they burned you up there. They took all my stuff. 
They burned down everything. You're in your house doing this on the telephone, talking to somebody else. They, they took everything out of my house. Because somebody else's house, when you lend your record player, got burnt down. That's their logic. What is this world coming to? I don't know. I'll tell you what it's coming to, sister. When you listen to the news, plane crashes, bus crashes, murders, rape, drugs, disease, famine, world war, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places, landslides, killer bees, you know what I'm saying? Incurable diseases. And now, when you look up at the sun, the sun is red as a sunset. And Jesus' prophecy is, when the sun becomes like blood, and nations shall rise against nations, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famine, and pestilence, and earthquakes in various far places, then know that the end of the world is near. That's what we're seeing when we look at television tonight. When we see death, and kids burn up on buses. Three buses simultaneously. Three buses. You know why everything is happening in threes now in the news? Have you noticed that? Not one plane will crash, but three planes will crash. Mm -hmm. Not one bus, but three buses. Not one strangulation and rape, but three strangulations and rape. Why is everything happening in three? Because the Heavenly Father is trying to tell me and you that this is not any coincidence. You understand? If it happened once, it's an incident. If it happens twice, it's a coincidence. If it happens three times, it is a warning. And if you watch the news, one plane falls out of the sky, and within the next three or four days, two more. One bus turns over, two more. One car runs on the sidewalk, kills people, two more. One girl is raped by some nut who incidentally is basically getting off, because he's going to do about a year and a half to be back in the street, because he's white. And then you have two more girls raped the same way and strangled. This is a work of the devil. The scripture says the devil will be loosed from his pit in the latter day and reap havoc in the world. The computer is the instrument the devil is using to control people like the Bible and Revelation says. The mark of the beast is a number controlled by a man. And when that devil gets let loose from that pit, he's going to turn this world into hell. Right now, we are living in hell. When you see crack addicts, you're looking at the dawn of the dead. You're looking at the living dead walk the streets. That's what they meant when the dead will walk the street, will come up out their graves. All the churches, preachers are getting caught every day. If they didn't tell y'all that the man who they replaced Jimmy Swagger with, they didn't put it on the news. Two weeks after, he got arrested for molesting children. The man that replaced him. Then the Catholics were boasting, well, that's the Pentecostals and the Protestants, and then a Catholic preacher, he got arrested molesting. Then there's another preacher in Harlem with a black wife, and he got arrested. But when your parents talk about me, they call me the deceiver. Oh, that man is deceiving you. That man is taking your money. That man is doing this. That man. And I live right here in Brooklyn, New York. I don't live in no mansion up on the hill. I'm not Jimmy Swagger. I'm not Tim Baker. These guys got houses big enough for me to put this whole community in. You understand? I live in the midst of my people, with my people, every day. It's a big difference. But Jesus told us that in the latter day that he was going to make the meek to dumbfound the wise. The heads of the churches are coming down. The prophet Muhammad referred to it as the removal of the heads of the job, the Antichrist. He said when the Messiah returns, he will remove the heads of the devil. He would move his head. You follow what I'm saying? The whole world was being deceived by these people. Not just America. These men, these evangelist preachers and born again preachers had ministries all over the world. Speaking in Spanish and Malay and in Arabic and every language of the world propagating these lies. And you were warned that those days would come. Many false preachers will come in my name saying they are of me and are not, Jesus said. Mm -hmm. And they come in his name because the person they say is they're Christian. And shall deceive many. And tell you about because of their evils, the hearts of many shall be waxed cold. What does that mean? It means that you've been betrayed so much 
to now you don't know who to trust no more. Your heart has a coat like wax on it. You done put your heart in everybody's hands and you feel so deceived, you don't know where to turn no more. And that's why I set up this kind of forum. That's why I didn't set up a forum like Reverend Jimmy Swag and them. I set up a forum where people who are hurt can come in and just say, man, listen, I'm going to talk to you, brother. What does this mean? Why do they say this? What does that mean? What is this? None of them won't do this. Swag and them ain't going to set up no question and answer period where people can just sit down and ask them questions. Because you might ask them something too personal. That woman might have walked in the congregation and just asked them in public. You follow? Mm -hmm. That's why it's set up this way in this day and time. Because we have been betrayed by so many people that we don't know where to turn no more. And we cannot blame the Heavenly Father for our vulnerableness. We can't blame our Heavenly Father because we're so stupid. We listen to everybody because Jesus said, when you see that spirit, test that spirit to see whether or not it is of God. But we don't do that. We walk in the church. We like the way the man sounds, and we don't never ask any questions. We just sit there, and from Sunday to Sunday, he just preaches and preaches and preaches and preaches, and we never just ask him to explain himself. So if we don't question people, a man tells me he's a Pentecostal, prove it to me in the Bible. Where's it at? Why? The same way y'all ask me, ask them. If you don't do that, you're entitled to be betrayed by them. You should be betrayed if you don't ask questions. You understand what I'm saying? But I, again, I want to go back to the beginning because I don't want to lose your heart. Don't change your heart. But just be careful who you trust it to. Regardless of what color they are. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> You have been listening to The True Light, sponsored by The Original Tents of Kedar, located at 717 Bushwick Avenue in Brooklyn, New York.